chapter 2, verses 8 through 14, famous passage about the shepherds. But before we read, let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your word, and as we read it this morning, we ask that you would move on our hearts by the power of your spirit, that we might be receptive to your word, that we might through your spirit understand it, and that through your spirit we would be strengthened to be doers of it. In Christ's name we pray. Luke chapter 2, starting with the 8th verse. In that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be unto God. There was a man who had to get his hair cut, but he hated to go because his barber talked constant, would not shut up. And so he went, and the barber said, how would you like your hair cut? And the man answered, in silence, please. <laughs> this is one of the most ancient jokes known to humankind, believe it or not. This joke was written in an ancient Greek book of jokes 1,600 years ago. That's kind of amazing to think that a joke written that long ago that is still funny to us today. And, you know, when we think about the ancient people, we often don't think of them being like us. You know, we think of stern, bearded men in their robes going about their business and women going about their hard work and daily tasks, and we don't think about them being much like us. But the truth is, human beings are the same. You know, our souls are still the same. We still have the same trials and sorrows and joys and the same needs as, as we did then. As we just saw, you know, they, the we like jokes, so did they. And, uh, you know, we cry at funerals, so did they. Uh, we like a good meal, and so did they. And, you know, just like we sometimes do, they too complain about a lot of the same things, about their bosses sometimes, about their work maybe about politicians of the day, certainly. Uh, also, they uh, had famous people, and whenever they were around, they flocked to see them and to, uh, to uh, say that they shook hands with them, just as people today do the same thing. You know, they didn't have, I guess, the glossy uh, magazines or the television shows like we do now that focus in on the rich and famous where we can see them and all their glitz and glamour and the parties that they have. But they had stories of the same that they passed around to each other that made the rounds, just as television shows do today, uh, of the same thing. And some of those actually made their way into the scripture. If you remember the stories of Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar's uh, parties, you know, being the same kind of description of parties we have now. And for folks like them, just like us, that was often the only real glimpse you got of that kind of rich and powerful crowd because, you know, just like now, you know, folks don't run in those circles, you know. I probably won't be invited to the palace in Buckingham anytime soon <laughs> to do anything. And I probably won't be invited to a party in Hollywood anytime soon, which thank goodness for that. But, uh, you know, we just don't run in the same circles. Uh, and just as now, then, people often ran with people who were like them, you know. Poor people run with poor, rich with rich, middling with middling, uh, because it's just kind of a human nature sometimes. You like to be with people who are like you, you know, it kind of makes you feel comfortable. And, you know, sometimes it may be prejudice or class envy, but sometimes it's just human nature. And so when, you know, royalty was born, you would have expected that royalty would have been born in a palace. Uh, surrounded by guards, and that the newborn baby would be sated with every possible luxury. 
a shepherd of that time and place would never have thought that they would ever be able to see a royal captive <coughs> close. Uh, in fact, probably would have dreaded doing so. If they, somebody of that station in nature saw a king, it was probably not a good thing. You know, it was probably the last thing they would probably see. And so, uh, you know, shepherds would not have thought to be able to see a king. They were rather lowly in their age, uh, often looked down upon as being a rough and tumble bunch. And having to deal with animals, they sometimes were made ritually unclean because animals do unclean things sometimes. And then animals die, and you have to deal with that. And as far as temple rules were concerned, that would have made them ritually unclean. And so uh, shepherds would never have considered themselves as possibilities for a visitation of angels. You know, that was something reserved for the extremely pious, for the extremely religious learning. And that's simply the way the world was. But as we see in today's scripture, that world was about to be turned upside down. Because as scripture tells us, God is no respecter of persons. He does not abide by the walls that we so often set up between one another. And he does not stand on human convention. He is not bound by human rules and human tradition. And the world sometimes forgets that. And it sometimes forgot it then as well. But God is just about to remind them here with the birth of the long-awaited Messiah. Because this Messiah was not born into a golden palace, but was born in a stable. Was not wrapped in a silk blanket, but was wrapped in strips of cloth torn from excess clothing probably. Was surrounded not by palace servants, but by God's humble, simple animal. And was born not to the famous or the rich, but to the simple and humble Mary. And to Joseph, the, the stepfather, who also was just a regular clerk, folks, just like us. And when the announcement went out, it went out not by you know, royal guards out to the palace favorites and the nobility of the land. No, it was announced, first of all, to shepherds. People who had not known the king among themselves. Uh, or from themselves since the time of King David, generations before. And the heralds were not royal heralds, but the greatest heralds of all, I guess. And that's God's own heralds, the angels, who came and sang the good news to them. It was fitting that the announcement of such startlingly important and good news should come first to these humble, ordinary working folks. Because just as it is now, back then, it was the kings who levied the taxes and made war and declared laws and made what the social norms were, regardless of what regular folks thought or how they fit into it. And so it was often to their detriment and left them in misery and fear and turmoil and with heavy burdens. People who really had no recourse to power to change anything. But this new king, this shepherd king who was born in a manger would be very different. He came not to start a war, but to bring peace, first to hearts and then eventually to the whole world. He came not to place burdens on people's shoulders, but to lift burdens. He came not to cause fear, but that fears might be relieved. He came not to make us slaves, but to set us free from the slavery we've sold into ourselves to the sins that we have committed. He came not to humble us with his power, but to give the humble great power in the name of the Lord to do great good. He didn't come to glorify the kingdoms of works of humans, but came to give glory to God the Father. And so this king would be a very different king indeed, coming first as an humble servant, walking dirt roads instead of riding on the back of some very expensive horse, and eating with normal, ordinary folks, and even with folks that the well-to-do would consider rabble. And in the end, he would end up being tortured and executed like a common criminal. But he did all this out of his love for us. Unlike a lot of kings, he actually did good for people. Healing the sick, casting out the evil spirits, teaching what was right, and in the end, shedding his blood for the forgiveness of our sins. This king, this shepherd king, the prince of peace, 
This king is our king. And what an amazing joy that should be to our hearts. You know, there's probably a lot of people and a lot of things in this world who claim sovereignty over us, who want to order us about and tell us what to do. But in truth, the Lord and the Lord alone is our true king. And he is a king who knows by experience what it is that we face. Because he has faced the same hurts and pains and sorrows. And he has lived with the same joys and laughter that we do. Yet he is one with the power and the will and the love to save us and redeem us. This is why totalitarian powers around the world throughout history have feared the gospel and tried to shut it down because it talks about a king who actually wins people's hearts and whom people love. Horace Greeley, a newspaper editor back in the 1800s, once famously said, you cannot read the Bible and remain a slave for very long. Because the Word sets you free. It points to the Word incarnate, Christ Jesus, who is the one who sets us free. Authoritarian governments from Rome 2,000 years ago all the way through North Korea today either ban Scripture and ban the Gospel in the church or they try to co-opt it and corrupt it in order to dampen its impact. We see this throughout history. You know, I mean, see it in the life of the Third Reich, see it in the Soviet Union and its Eastern Empire, and Idi Amin's Uganda, all the way up even to China today. And even, you maybe not even have heard about it, even in Chiapas in southern Mexico, where probably 300,000 people have been driven from their homes because of their beliefs, and hundreds have been killed. More Christians have died for their faith in the past 100 years than in all the other Christian history combined. So we might ask ourselves, why is it that this one faith is singled out for such persecution? Why do its believers suffer so? Well, because there is real power in serving the king who turned the world upside down. A king who will not be corrupted by power, who will not be dictated to by cultural elites, but who tells the unvarnished truth, who is himself the truth and often a mirror in which the blemishes and warts of the world and the worldly become startlingly clear. And ordinary people, everyday folks, who turn their hearts to that king also have such power in their hearts through the Spirit and with such peace and assurance in their souls that they too become a threat, just as the king was, just as he promised would be. The powers of darkness which have seemingly ruled for so long, shaking their boots at the mention of this shepherd king. Scripture tells us they flee at the name of Jesus because they know that through the birth and life and death and resurrection of this king who the angels sang of to the shepherds, that their defeat was at hand and that this king means not only their end but the salvation of his people whom they despise. This scene that we read from the scripture today is a very simple passage, very pastoral, and this bringing of the good news of, of the birth of the shepherd, the birth of the shepherd king to the shepherds. And it's, uh, you might even say it's a quiet scene, as you might see in the song of Silent Night. But it is a powerful one, so powerful that it rocked the world then and continues to do so today because the shepherd king has come the world will never be the same. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the birth of our King. We thank you that our King has turned the world upside down. That our King knows us by heart. That our King has faced the same sorrows and temptations, has faced the same joys that we do. He knows us and loves us and has poured out his mercy upon us. Lord, with that peace and assurance and joy in our souls, help us to go into this world and be unbreakable in sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with those around us. In this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior.